Recording has started. All right, great. So welcome everybody to our monthly Ask an Expert session, an introduction to Intel FPGAs. My name is Steve. I have been with Altera and now Intel for 18 years and been in our training group for 16 years, uh, teaching instructor-led and virtually and online all sorts of different topics. These days I focus on uh, system design, uh, design debugging and high-speed memory interfaces. And you can see my email there. Uh, for the university folks who are attending, I hope we have, have a whole bunch, welcome. Um, Cornell, class of 95, BSEE, RPI, class of 98, MNG. So um, that's where I've been and uh, here I am now working for Intel. So um, Steve, did you wanna explain the question and answer aspect of this? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so feel free to ask questions, ask questions, whatever you're most comfortable with. If uh, you want to use the audio, uh, by all means, just go ahead and unmute yourself. And, and if you wouldn't mind keeping, keeping yourselves on mute during the, during the presentation, that way we can minimize any background noise. That'd be great. Uh, if you prefer not to use the audio, I will be monitoring the chat window. And so just go ahead and type your questions in the chat. And, uh, and at, a, at, a, at a, an appropriate time, when there's an appropriate pause, I'll go ahead and uh, um, give uh, give the question to Steve. Um, OK, yeah, I think that's it. Back to you, Steve. Great. Thanks, Steve. Yes, a little confusing to Steve, but <laughs> we, 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 we deal with it. Uh, so the ground rules uh, of our Ask an Expert session, um, any question you can think of about what we're talking about is fair game over the phone or in the chat. If it's something detail, very detailed, design specific, I'll try to answer it if I can, but I don't want to spend a lot of time because I want to get as many questions in as possible. Uh, and uh, if we can't answer in a reasonable amount of time, we'll try to follow up with you after the session. Uh, we may even point you to your local FAE if, uh, if that is appropriate. So, okay. Let's go on and start talking about FPGAs. So big question right off the bat is why programmable logic? Uh, what, is, what is the point of all of this? Uh, well, typically in a board design, you have something like this. You have a board and you have multiple devices on that board and you have to put in all those devices, um, route the connections between them, build the board uh, and make sure everything works. And if it doesn't, you, you have to respin the board. <laughs> it's basically uh, a, a difficult and expensive process right off the bat. Um, but one of the neat things about an FPGA is that we can combine many, if not all of the functions that are available in uh, on a board into a single device. Um, so we could reduce the size of our board, reduce the complexity of our board, and improve uh, our debugability, so to speak. Um, we don't have to completely re-spin the board. If a change is needed, we could make a change to the FPGA design. So I wanted to show this just as a, a starting point to show you know, why FPGAs are cool. And then we're gonna go into what an FPGA actually is. So in the beginning, um, digital logic was usually represented with TTL logic, transistor transistor logic chips. Uh, you would find the chips that you need, you would find the gates on those chips that you needed, and you would manually wire them together. Uh, this was made famous, at least it was for me, back when I was in school with the TI-7400 device family where we would need to go through a bin of chips, put them on a board, and wire them all together to get the logic function that we needed. Uh, back then, design choices that you made for your design were determined by cost and the available devices that you had on hand. Now, when you're building a design like that, building a logic function like that, you usually start out with a truth table. So you know what your inputs are going to be and you determine what the appropriate output should be for a particular set of inputs. So you build a truth table and then you take that truth table. And if you haven't learned about it yet, you, oops, where's our animation here? Why is that not working? Okay, that's unusual. Try that again. Okay, my slides are not advancing. That's very unusual. I'll go to the next one. But anyway, um, you take your true table and you turn it into a Carnot map. So a Carnot map is a grid 
of uh, where you break apart the multiple inputs and you put a one wherever the output will be a one output for that particular set of inputs. Um, you these are referred to as min terms wherever there is a one and then you draw rings around the ones uh, again you may or may not have encountered this yet in a digital logic class in school uh, but we use the ringed mid -ter min terms to build up a logic expression and hopefully this is going to work there it goes all right so we build a logic expression from our carnot map and we are able to turn that logic expression into a function that matches up with the logic that we have available, the TTL logic we have available. So in the example shown here, these represent all the min terms in uh, my design, and I turn it into a logic expression that matches up with the functions that I have available in chips. So you can see that we create a design where we have our NAND gates, we have a couple of registers, and the numbers here indicate the chip that we would have needed back in the day to build this logic function. Okay. So looking at a design like this, um, what you tend to notice is that you build a bunch of combinatorial logic that then feeds into registers for storage. And we refer to that as the sum of products because usually you're taking your inputs and you are um, summing together a number of product terms, sending them all through an, uh, an, a NAND gate in this case to get a final result that then gets stored. Okay, so this is really the key to everything um, after it. But back in the day, this was the only way that you could build a design. So with that in mind, we want to be able to take that and turn it into something that's a little bit easier to use than just one or two chips that we put on a board and have to manually connect. So again, looking at the results, we see the general features of a logic implementation are a sum of products, which is the and or gates that I just showed you, and the stored results that get wired together. Now, what if logic functions were able to be, uh, were fixed like they are with the TTL logic we just looked at, but were able to be combined into a single device as opposed to being spread across multiple devices? And what if there was a way that we could control the routing, how we connect these different logic functions together, just like on a breadboard, if we could control that in a device itself, then we wouldn't need all these multiple chips and manual wiring between them. So the first programmable logic came out of these ideas and it was called a PAL, a Programmable Array Logic. Okay, so it was a simple implementation of programmable logic where the logic gates and functions are fixed and the way of building your sum of products was programmable. Okay, so there were multiple parts to it. There's the programmable array where you could use different programming techniques to decide whether you're using the, um, the normal or inverted version of an input and make a connection to a wire to form your, uh, your AND part of the uh, sum of products. And then the product terms are then fed into an OR gate okay, for the final result, which is then stored in a register. The OR gate with the final result and the register are sometimes referred to as a macro cell. So back in these older devices, you'd see the macro cell and that may refer to just the end of the sum of products here and the register, or it could refer to the entire, um, uh, the entire setup we have here. But uh, in general, we think of the storage of the final result as the macro cell. So the advantages Steve, of this, yes, the question. Uh, sorry, Steve, I, 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 a little pause there. So there's a comment there that say that um, we've teached, uh, or sorry, that have ceased to teach about logic reduction in classes these days because the computer does a, does a better job. And so that was, uh, anyway, an interesting comment there. Okay, well then that just means I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I, I looked at that too and I was like, yeah, well, that that, uh, that makes sense. And it means, means I'm old too. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, it's good, yeah. good to know. Yeah, so yeah, just a just a quick little history lesson for for you here. Um, again, yeah, nobody nobody does this anymore. Um, 
but we're just showing the evolution of, of how we got to where we are today. So, but yeah, I am old. <laughs> uh, so the advantages of this were that fewer devices were required. We wouldn't need as much board real estate, lowers the cost, lower power because we're using fewer devices, simpler to test and debug because everything was contained into a single device. Um, design security, because everything is in a single device, it's more difficult to reverse engineer what's going on in that device as opposed to looking at you know individual chips with markings that tell you exactly what they are. Design flexibility, um, automated tools that could simplify and consolidate that design flow. And the key thing was the in-system reprogrammability, the idea that you have this chip on your board, you don't have to um, burn a new chip, you don't have to do anything to uh, re replace that chip. It's all right there in on the same board. Now, PALs were then expanded into the first programmable logic devices or PLDs, which is basically taking a PAL and uh, basically copying and pasting it, so to speak, uh, arranging multiple PALs into a single device, usually with different sizes of some of product terms. So you can see that we've got some with smaller number of inputs, some with larger to allow for more complex functions. Okay. We also have programmable macro cells um, that could be configured to decide whether you wanted to store the result or have a purely combinatorial function that bypasses the register. Okay. So um, it was just the next logical step, taking an individual PAL and then duplicating it. Okay. Um, oh, this is what I was just saying. So the number of inputs would vary. So you could, you know, use the one with fewer inputs for a simpler function and use the ones with more inputs for more complex functions if needed. Now the macro cells also were starting to get more complicated to give you more options for what to do with the output. Okay. So you could decide whether you wanted true combinatorial or inverted combinatorial bypassing the register, true registered or inverted registers by putting the register in the path, but also the option um, of oh, sending out to an IO pin, of course, but also the option of being able to feed back into the array. So you could have a stored result that then could be used again in another part of the design. Okay. Oh, you'll also notice uh, carry lines. So we have carry bits that can be generated and saved for moving from function to function, especially like if you're perform, uh, performing addition. So from the PLD, we went to the <laughs> very simply named CPLD, the complex PLD, which took PLDs and now we create multiple PLDs um, and basically rearrange them such that the programmable inter uh, the programmable part of the sum of products is kind of in the center. Um, and so we create a programmable interconnect when we do this. Uh, so we still have our logic blocks and our macro cells that can connect to IO or feed back into the programmable interconnect. So again, we can start seeing how we are able to create more complex functions that can then feed into each other and create more complex designs. So in a C CPLD, once we get to this point, a CPLD, the, um, the logic functions, the logic blocks that I have arranged around here in the CPLD are often referred to as logic array blocks or labs, okay? A lab can contain multiple macro cells. That's typically between four and 20. Um, and they also contain local programmable interconnect like a PLD, so not only is there programmable interconnect to connect the multiple logic blocks together, but there's programmable interconnect in each logic block to customize the logic there. There are also expander product terms. So this is basically just feedback into the logic block. Again, so you could reuse a function that you've already uh, created a result for and then uh, have a, a new result from that. The uh, penalty for doing something like this, though, is additional delay. So as you add more combinatorial logic into a path, that adds delay and, of course, can um, 
you know, slow the speed that you can run the design at. Now, back in the day, these weren't as big issues, uh, depending on the clock speed that you were running at. But uh, any amount of delay today, as we'll see with FPGAs, um, can have a great effect on the design. So you'll need to perform things like time enclosure, which we'll touch on a little bit later on. So CPLDs, other architectural features of CPLDs, they had the programmable interconnect array, which was sometimes referred to as the PI or the PIA, which is similar to the programmable array in a PAL. They had global routing connects so that any signal could connect to any destination in the device. It could connect to other logic blocks. It could connect into the array. It could connect to IO. Okay. Now the programmable interconnect was programmed using some type of technology, um, non-volatile technology, EEPROM, EEPROM, or Flash. Okay. And depending on the technology of the device, it would use different types of special transistors that um, could be programmed in a certain way with particular um, uh, electrical pulses um, and could be reset at any time in different ways. Sometimes, uh, you know, you would take you would take the chip and you'd put it into a UV, an ultraviolet oven, basically to erase the uh, erase what was programmed. So um, they were programmable and resettable and reprogrammable. Uh, in different ways, depending on the technology used. Now, the I.O. part of it, uh, the I.O. is separated from the logic by the programmable interconnect. And the I.O. also had its own unique functions to provide control and more features. Uh, so you'd find things like tri-state buffers um, that allowed you to have choose between whether an I.O. should be an input, an output, or bidirectional. We can look closer. Oh, sorry. Just take a pause at this point. Uh, Steve, are there any questions or anything in the chat that we want to? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so the question a question came in. Uh, how will a person designing logic know when the logic's time delay is reasonable? When is it too slow or perhaps too fast? So um, in the old days, <laughs> uh, there wasn't really too much you could do other than test it in hardware. Um, you run your clock, you would test in hardware, see if your signals are, are correct. Um, today, when we're talking about FPGAs, and we'll get to it later on, you have to perform time enclosure. And there are tools that uh, have complete uh, timing models, timing information about the device that understand setup and hold times throughout the device, um, the delay on every wire and through every component in the device, such that when you create your design and you run this tool, it can calculate what the delays will be and if you will be able to meet timing. And it will generate reports for you so you can see if you're going to be meeting timing or not. And if not, pinpoint to you exactly where you're not going to meet timing, at which point then you can, can go on and, uh, and debug your design and, and make changes to try to be able to meet timing. So today there's lots of tools. Um, and uh, we'll touch on Cordis, which is our tool uh, that makes it really easy to find where there are issues. But yeah, back in the day, it was really just hardware testing. So any others, Steve? No, that's it. Thank you. OK. So the advantages of CPLDs over PLDs, um, by this point, we started having large amounts of logic and the IOs were getting much more complicated, much more feature rich than they had been in the past. We got our programmable routing. Uh, they were instant on, um, so you would just turn them on and immediately they would already be programmed uh, and ready to go. Low cost, non-volatile, and reprogrammable, as I was just mentioning. Steve, another question came in. Yes. Um, why are clock speeds of FPGA so much slower than typical Intel processor speeds? That's a good question. Um, what's the best way to explain that? Uh, well, so when you're talking about a um, an ASIC, a dedicated device like a processor, uh, it's designed specifically to run at a super high clock speed. Um, you get a rating when you when you buy a processor that says runs up to this speed. Uh, well, with an FPGA, um, you know, when we create an FPGA, you don't really know what types of designs people are going to put in there. 
Um, some designs are simpler and can run faster. Some designs are more complicated and uh, may not be able to run as fast. Um, with the programmable array and the features in an FPGA, there's more stuff in an FPGA that can change depending on the design that you've created. So there is, is the potential for more delay. Um, it's they're, they're, they just don't run as fast as dedicated uh, dedicated hardware in an ASIC. Steve, did you want to expand on that at all? Sure. Yeah, I could I can add a add a couple more yeah. things. Uh, probably probably same to what you said. But it, but if you consider the FPGA, everything is programmable inside there. That includes the clock tree. So every time you go through a transistor that has been set up a certain way, that will delay the signal going from from point A to point B. Uh, whereas you know, like Steve was saying, with an ASIC, it's it's dedicated circuitry inside there. So since it's dedicated circuitry, there's no switching going on at all. Okay. The the from point A to point B is fast. Whereas in the FPGA, point A to point B, who knows how many how many transistors you know, or how many switches you have to go through there before it gets there. So that that's really the um, the biggest factor as to why clock speeds in FPGAs are slower than uh, dedicated ASIC. Okay, great. Any other questions there, Steve? Nope, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. So, so at this point, we were at CPLDs, okay? Uh, and then finally, FPGAs came into the picture. So FPGAs really um, took off in uh, the early 80s. Uh, that's when Altera, my former company, <laughs> uh, came around. Um, and it basically took the idea of the CPLDs and again, moved things around um, and added additional features because the technology allowed it now. So, um, we're gonna dive into the different parts of an FPGA, but just wanted to show you an overview of what an FPGA looks like. Well, first of all, FPGA stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And um, field programmable, meaning that it can be reprogrammed out in the field. The design can be, oops, the design can be changed out in the field at any time. Um, gate array, so it is an array of different device resources. Okay. So the programmable interconnect and the logic blocks I was talking about for the CPLD have now been distributed and moved around and duplicated many, many times in order to create the array. Okay. So we're going to look at the different parts that make up an FPGA. So we've got labs, which is where the combinatorial logic functions happen, similar to what we were looking at earlier with the PALs and the CPLDs. Um, memory block resources, DSP block resources, PLLs for clocking, high-speed transceivers for data transfer between devices and wherever you want to connect to, as well as hardened IP blocks. So there's a big difference between a CPLD and an FPGA, and it really was just being able to shrink devices, be able to put more resources in a device and rearrange how everything is connected together. But there are other, there are some other significant differences between FPGAs and CPLDs that we'll touch on in this section. So looking at the logic implementation in an FPGA, um, we look at the lowest level and looking at what are referred to as logic elements. So logic elements were what was used in the oldest FPGAs. And they look very similar to the macro cells or programmable arrays of the previous generations of devices. But as you can see, it's basically um, uh, the three main parts for generating the logic, for generating carry signals and the register. And then there's lots of available paths for how the data is transferred and how the data is stored, all of which is programmable. Okay, that's really the key here. Everything is programmable, everything is customizable to create the function exactly the way that you want it. So we're going to look at each of these parts in a little bit more detail. The first part of the logic element is the lookup table. Okay, so a lookup table is a change from the way that we looked at the um, sum of products terms earlier. Um, sum of products terms use specific AND and OR gates, um, whereas a lookup table is expands on that idea a little bit by basically creating a set of cascaded multiplexers. Okay, 
If you have multiplexers arranged in such a way and you program and control their inputs and select lines appropriately, you can generate pretty much any logic function that you want. Okay. So as an example, let's say I wanted to create the logic function shown here and I wanted to um, I want to create the logic function that's shown here. Okay. So the way that it works is that um, and again, the tools handle all this. You could do this all yourself manually, but at this point, um, it's gotten so complicated that it would be very difficult for a person to be able to do this. So the tools actually do this and decide how the programming is going to work. But the um, inputs to your lookup table are the select line. So A, B, C, D would be the inputs that you would be providing, and you want to get an X output. Okay. So looking at a particular path through here for a particular term of our output, we can see the programmable program value that would be needed. So based on A, B, C, and D to get A, B, C bar, D bar, C inverted, D inverted, we can follow the path. So one, one, zero, zero to go through or A, B, C, and D, okay? And wherever we want to use that path, we program the input to the LUT to be high, okay? Wherever there is a high input, that means it's a path that will be used as part of the logic function. And that is the programmed information that gets stored somewhere when the device gets programmed. So in this way, through these cascaded multiplexers, we can build any logic function we want, okay? And again, we can connect multiple lookup tables together to create even more complex functions. Okay, so that is really the key to the combinatorial aspect of an FPGA, these cascaded multiplexer arrays. Oops, okay. So moving from the lookup table over to the programmable register. So the register has um, uh, many functions, many of the control signals that you would expect, clock enables, resets, synchronous and asynchronous logic, presets, et cetera, everything that you would need to set up the data stored in the register however you want, okay? So the clock is trip typically driven by a global clock signal. So we've got our clock coming in here. I don't know if I have an app animation on that. So we've got a clock coming in here. And um, depending on the device, the clock, again, may be a direct line from some clock source, or it might come from a global clock that drives the entire device. Um, different FPGAs have different clock resources that are available like that. Um, you've got your data coming in, and you've got your control for how the data is going to be stored. Um, there's asynchronous control through other blocks, feedback back into the LUT. So you could have a stored value be fed back into this lookup table or elsewhere to other lookup tables. You can also bypass the register. So we could actually have two functions in a single logic element, a combinatorial function and a synchronous function. So we could use just the lookup table or just the register or both of them together. And again, every connection you see is part of the programming. Um, the connections are made when the device is programmed based off of your design. And this is showing just bypassing the lookup table and using this as a pure synchronous, uh, synchronous function, um, just register storage. We also have carry and register chains. This is how we have connections between logic elements in order to create larger combinatorial functions. So we can have carry in coming from another logic element or lab, and we can have connections coming out of this logic element to another logic hey, element or lab. Steve, Steve, yes. sorry, I'm gonna I'm gonna interrupt you here because there's a question that came in. I think was uh, germane to uh, the previous slide or what what you're talking about. It's a uh, uh, so one one question there. Um, 
does your example imply that deeper LUTs, your example for deep, take more clock cycles to operate and are therefore slower? Seems to be implied that cycles required, you know, equals log underscore two and then the width of the multiplexer input. Um, so let's, I, maybe I missed the main so, part, part of the question. So I think the, I, the, the delay yeah. through this, is that the question? Yeah, so I, I think I think what they're I, I uh, I'm going to try and read between the lines there, Paul. Um, the uh, uh, he's talking about you know the the more levels of logic is going to take longer, and I guess the simple answer to that question is is yes. Um, but however, with this slide, maybe maybe uh, explain a little bit uh, the structure of this slide again, Steve. Okay, so um, the the. So yes, so there is going, there's inherently delay when you're programming. This again goes back to what we answered earlier about um, about delay in an FPGA versus an ASIC. Um, the thing is that uh, these are uh, these are meant to be very small and simple. And also this this technology here, um, you know, it's uh, it's meant to be able to get results quickly. Um, we're going to go to ALMs in a little bit, which uh, which expand on this idea and make it more optimized than even this. So in this example, for example, yes, uh, in this example, for example, that doesn't make any sense. But anyway, in this example, yes, you are fixed at a delay of four here. Um, any signals that need to get through here are going to have to get through the whole array. When we get to newer technology like an ALM, then that can be customized and optimized specifically for the combinatorial function that you are creating. Okay, so it's a matter of you know we had fixed uh, fixed number of logic levels to newer devices where it's more customizable, more optimized, uh, optimizable, so to speak. Okay, so I don't know if that answers the question. Does that kind of answer the question? I, uh, I think it does. Let's see, he had a okay. follow on. He said, uh, so does going from A to B, C to D take one clock cycle each? Well, this isn't this isn't clocked at all. This is combinatorial functions. So this is as soon as this is programmed at when the device is initially programmed, this is just logic functions. So the only clocking comes into play when we're talking about the register. So is the question about the register or the lookup table? The, uh, the the lookup table. Um, okay. If, if if you don't mind, I I'd like to add a little bit too. Go ahead. Uh, sure. On the, on the on the previous slide. Yes. The uh, so with this with this slide, what we're looking at is we're looking at a four input lookup table. So you could look at it like a like a memory cell. So what we have here specifically is just you know the delay that it will take to go through this particular lookup table. So those multiplexers that you see there are just um, it's uh, analogous to how the lookup table works inside there. So what we're looking at here is just one lookup table and then the delay going through the lookup table. So there isn't there isn't the concept of A, B, C, and D inside this lookup table. It's just a memory cell. And the uh, whatever whatever inputs on A, B, C, and D exist, uh, the outputs will be produced based off of the programming that's listed down on the bottom there. Yep, exactly. So basic, basically the A, B, C, and D represents the address of this tiny memory cell. And then when you poke, when you when you take a look at that particular address, the memory cell is just going to output, you know, whatever values at that memory address. And so this 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 specifically is just a lookup table. And again, the multiplexers there just illustrate how the lookup table functions. I like that explanation. Thank you. That's great. The um, okay, there there is um, there is another uh, comment here, more about the software side of it. Maybe we could uh, go on a little little tangent here. So let's see. So using FPGAs to teach digital logic at uh, Utah Valley University, Cordis is a beast to support on 20 different laptops. This is complicated by the licensing requirements on the latest versions. Our university has strict privacy rules that will not let me require my students to give out their personal information to external entities. Your licensing for the submitter requires this. We're stuck using version 20.1 for this reason. Is there uh, Are there any plans to allow using the new simulator without registration, and I'm not I'm not aware of, of any plans with that. Are, are you, Steve? Um, yeah. Okay. So 
yeah, this is a, a tangent. We'll we'll touch on the Cordis software, which is the main. For those who don't know, that is the the main design software that you use in order to build all of this without having to manually build up your uh, your lookup tables like this. Um, but uh, getting to the question, uh, the Light Edition is free. It doesn't require any licensing. Are they referring to Questasim? Is that is is that? Or they yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they're they're referring they're referring to Questasim. Yeah. Okay. The, the free so, version of Questa, and I, I think I think we do require that they register, even though it's free. But they have to say it's like, hey, look, you know, I'm using the free yeah, version of Questa Sim. Yeah, yeah, you need a free license. You need a free license for that. So, um, I don't know of any plans to change something like that because you know we're basically borrowing from 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 Mentor. So, um, need some kind ki- some type of registration for that. That's why we have free licenses for that. No, unfortunately, sorry. Any other questions there, Steve? Um, none. Uh, let's see. Nope. No. Uh, no more questions. Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, no. Sorry, there is one. One just came in. <laughs> let's see. Yes. I have a, I have a Cordis question as well. Are there any plans to open up uh, free mode on Cordis uh, modes for higher level chips? Uh, you mean beside? I mean besides light. Yeah, besides um, light, so how how it's a device limited, you know, for example, are we going to have a free version that will be able to target Agilex? Yeah, I I I doubt that. Um, I, obviously, I'm not I'm not involved with those types of decisions, but um, you know, the the idea has been that if you're working with a lower end device like a Max or a Cyclone or an older uh, an older device, then you can use the free edition for the newest devices they're using. You know, pe- companies buy licenses for the uh, um, for the full version of Cordis that works specifically with those higher end devices. Um, but I'm not I'm not privy to any any changes to allow for a free version for higher end devices. So, anything else, Steve? Uh, that's it. Okay. All right. So we were talking. We talked about the registers, and then I was talking about the carry and register chains that allow for connections in and out of the logic elements and between logic elements and labs. Um, and yeah, so this is just showing again coming from another logic element in a chain. So if you're performing a more complex function. A carry in from a previous LE and feed that directly into the register uh, as opposed to having to go through the lookup chain. So this is the way that you could have a, um, a shift register, so to speak. There's also the idea of register packing, which I kind of alluded to, the idea that you could have separate functions between the lookup table and the register. So you can pack into a single logic element two separate functions, one that is purely uh, combinatorial and one that is purely synchronous. Okay, so separate outputs allow for this. Separate inputs and outputs allow for this. And our tools automatically can do register packing like this as needed to save resources. Okay, so Logic elements were what were used in uh, and are still used in older, lower end uh, FPGA devices. Um, but then uh, with newer devices and again, smaller technologies able to fit more logic into a device, we moved to adaptive logic modules or ALMs. Okay? Um, ALMs are based on LEs but they include additional dedicated resources as well as an adaptive lookup table or ALUT. Okay. Um, an ALUT is an expansion on the cascading MUX LUT that I talked about earlier, but can customize as needed for your design. So here is a typical example of an ALM. So in higher end devices or newer devices, um, Instead of the single lot, single carry uh, logic, single uh, register, you might have an ALM that looks like this, where you have two registers, or even in more complex devices, might even have that up to four. Uh, you have dedicated adders with carry chains, so that is a function that people use a lot, so you have dedicated hardware for that. And you have the most interesting part of this, which is the ALUT, the adaptive LUT. De- 
depending on the device, an ALUT could have up to uh, eight inputs. Uh, I haven't looked recently if newer devices might have even more. But the idea is that instead of having a large complex function um, that has fixed resources, the ALUT, as its name implies, adapts depending on the way that you use it. So for example, you could have um, combine two functions together into a single ALM, a simpler function that maybe only requires one to three inputs and a slightly more complex function that might require four to five inputs. And the ALUT is adjusted as needed for the complexity of the function that is needed. So you could have a super complex logic function with many inputs and then just need to pass a single bit input into this to, for storage or it could be four and four. And you could also even for even more complex functions uh, be able to split between and have signals be used in both parts of the ALUT as needed. So all of this is programmable. The inputs are programmable. The use of the logic array is all programmable as well. And all of the components after the ALUT are programmable as well. So very, very flexible. Um, highly configurable. So we have these um, new ALMs in, still in labs. They're still organized into labs. And in the FPGA, the main aspect of the array part of FPGA is these labs. So instead of having them all centralized like they were in the CPLD, labs are arranged in, our, in an array all throughout the device. Okay. And instead of having the interconnect centralized, now there is interconnect wires all throughout the device as well. It's basically everything has been spread out. And between the labs, you have these interconnecting wires. Okay. And you have different lengths of wires. So you can see that there are some wires that can span the entire vertical or horizontal of the device. And you also have shorter wires that can connect between adjacent labs or connect between three or four labs, okay? And the use of all these wires is programmable. So when the device is programmed, the particular wires are used that are needed to get data from point A to point B, where it needs to go, okay? The tool that you use makes decisions on which wires to use to meet your design and timing requirements. So this again goes back, and everything goes back to timing. <clears throat> Of course, longer wires, especially in high speed running at higher speeds like we do today, longer wires can affect the functionality of your design and being able to meet timing. So if there are shorter wires available for a high speed function, then the compiler will choose those shorter wires to make those connections. And again, the tools these days now know all about the delays through and through each and every one of these resources, and that's how we're able to perform a detailed timing analysis. So we can take a closer look now at what the array looks like. So what this is a picture of, um, in our Cordis Prime design software, there is a tool called the Chip Planner. And the Chip Planner allows you to view the architectural details of your device and see which dedicated resources are being used as part of your design. So anything that's slightly uh, darker colored means that those are resources that are being used in your design. Uh, anything that's white or lighter colored, that means that that is an available resource that is not used in your design. You can also see the channels in between the labs, and that's where all the wires live, all the different uh, length wires, and they get colored as well when they are used in your particular design. So we could take a closer look at a particular lab, and this is an example of a lab where basically nothing is being used. Okay, so you've got the individual logic elements, uh, and you've got wires that connect between logic elements and also connect in and out of the lab. Um, you can even in our tools take an even closer look using a tool called the resource property editor. So this allows you to see a schematic representation of the logic element itself. 
So you can see in this, if your design was using particular resources, those resources are highlighted in blue. So you can see where the logic function is being used. You can see where carry logic is being used and signals coming in and out. In this example, you can see that this is a purely combinatorial function and the registers are not being used at all because they're still in gray. So the tools make it very easy to see what is going on and how your design is built up in the FPG device. Any questions at this point, Steve? Nope, we're, we're good. Okay. Uh, so IO elements. So um, one of the uh, big advantages going to an FPGA is the functionality and flexibility of the IO. Um, these days, when you are creating a design, IO, of course, is, is one of the most important things. And you need to be able to configure your IO to do all sorts of different things depending on the design. So in every IO, we call them IO elements. So every IO element in the device that connects to a device package pin has access to the, um, the LEs, the labs, and the interconnect in the device. So any logic can be connected to any available IO pin. And within the IO elements, you have a number of programmable features. Again, we, we already talked about switching between inputs, outputs, and bi-directional signaling, but you can also enable multiple IO standards. Um, you can have differential signals for clocks or other more high-speed signaling. You can adjust the drive strength as needed if maybe you're having signal integrity issues. You can adjust the slew rate as well. Uh, there's even the ability, depending on your needs, to add in termination uh, resistors um, instead of having to add physical resistors on your board, you just enable those inside the IO element. Saves more board space and uh, simplifies your board design. Um, you can have open drain or tri-state, um, and this is just a short list of the things that you can do with the IO elements. There are many, many more features, and depending on your device, there might be uh, even more that are not listed here or um, that you, you need to look up. So here's an example, a very simple example of an IO element. Again, modern IO elements have much more than this, but they all go back to the basics. There's three main parts to an IO element. There's the input path. So here's our device pin and there's the input path. So this is getting signals from the outside world into the array and we can have them fed in directly or it can be registered. We have an output path, obviously. We can have signals bypass these output registers and go directly to the device pin, or we can have output registers that then feed the uh, output pin. And then finally, if we need to use it um, for bidirectional uh, or tri-state, we have output enable control. So we can control for the output whether it should be tri-stated um, or the direction if we're creating a bi-directional design. So again, IO elements are much, much more complex than this, but they really boil down to these three key pieces. Now, what other resources are available in the FPGA? Well, you've got embedded memory blocks. So um, along with the logic array blocks throughout the device, you have Im these embedded memory blocks and the memory blocks allow you to have on chip memory that can be, um, since they're programmable, can be organized in different ways. So you could have single or dual port RAM. This is an example of a dual port RAM where we have two separate clocks driving two separate inputs and outputs to the single RAM block. If you disable uh, writing on an embedded memory block, you can turn it effectively into a ROM. Um, and you can connect multiple memory blocks together to create more complex structures and uh, such as shift registers or FIFOs. Okay. One other advantage of an FPGA memory block is that they can be initialized. So um, onboard RAM, is, you know, when you power up your board is basically empty um, and then has to be, you know, data needs to be stored there. But with an FPGA and a RAM block, you can store per, um, uh, memory contents in the memory blocks when you program the device. 
So this is useful for creating a ROM, of course, oops, for creating a ROM, of course, but it's also useful for testing and debugging. You can put values in um, and see how your design will work with those values that are already in the memory. So very flexible, very easy to use. Some devices have even simpler memory resources. Uh, newer devices have M labs, which are uh, smaller, very simple memory blocks that are more similar to labs than they are to dedicated memory like this. Um, again, that is device specific. We got DSP blocks for performing uh, high performance uh, multiplication operations and DSP functions. Uh, there are different types, but you've got your typical multiply, add, accumulate operations, uh, and then that can be expanded upon depending on your design. We also have high speed transceivers that are able to be customized and used for many different protocols. Uh, I just list Ethernet and PCIe here, but there are dozens of different high speed protocols that can be used and configured uh, in different ways uh, in all of our devices. Uh, clocking. So we talked about clocking earlier. So there are uh, dedicated clocking structures with many different options available in an FPGA for how you are going to clock your design. So of course, you need to bring in clocks from the outside world. So we've got dedicated clock input pins. And then you've got the internal resources. The main internal resource that's used for clocking is a PLL, which generates clock domains for use throughout the FPGA. We'll talk about that in a moment. FPGAs also <clears throat> include DLLs, delay lock loops, which are used to dynamically phase shift clock signals, typically for external memory interfaces. When you're calibrating an interface, um, you can use a DLL uh, to automatically align clocking with signals as needed. PLLs do this a little bit as well, but DLLs are dedicated to it. Clock control blocks. So these are resources in the device that uh, control what clocks are global in the design, how they get fed throughout the device. Um, also, they have clock enables, so you can easily enable or disable a clock for power savings, um, because when you shut down a clock, you're effectively not using power when, uh, other than static power when the, the device is just running. So when signals are not toggling, you reduce your dynamic power and you can save overall power in your design and you have control for that as well. And then there's the clock routing networks. So different devices have different resources for this, but think of them basically as large networks that can feed a clock to every resource in the device or feed certain areas of the device. Could be device quadrants or in newer devices, more targeted clocking to specific resources. Okay. So these are dedicated routing channels. So it's part of the interconnect, but other signals can't use it, only clocks can use it. So they're isolated from the data signals that are used. So we have the separate clock network that can be used at any time away from, so it doesn't use the resources needed for data signals. And just a quick example of what a PLL does. So a PLL is a way of taking a reference clock and being able to easily create um, additional clock domains and distribute those clocks throughout the device. So for example, you might have a 100 megahertz input clock coming from um, a crystal or oscillator on your board that comes into the device and it goes through a PLL and you can program the PLL to generate multiple clock domains. So for example, here we have a mirror of the 100 megahertz input clock. We have a multiply by two. So we have a 200 megahertz clock and we can also have a multiply by two phase shifted clock as well. The PLL has compensation features to compensate for the clock delay through the PLL itself, as well as through these clock routing networks. So it can automatically phase shift these output clocks appropriately to account for that additional delay, allowing you to run the design faster without worrying about the clock delay being a factor in the operation of your design. Um, I see we only have five minutes left, so just very quickly, 
Uh, the programming of FPGA devices is based off of SRAM technology. So this is key because FPGAs do need to be programmed every time you power them up. So they are uh, volatile. So the SRAM is used to make the connections. So for example, when we're connecting a row and column interconnect, an SRAM allows a connection between the row and column. Um, and this is what gets programmed when you first program the device. And since these are latches, they basically reset on power cycling. So devices, mu FPGAs must be programmed at power on. Steve, there's a, a question um, came in. Let's see, does Cordis depend on the operating system of the computer? Let's say the design was done with Windows 7. Uh, will it be the same if we run it on Windows 10? Yes. Um, yeah, whatever whatever version of uh, operating system you're running on, uh, a project should work in any any version as long as Cordis runs on that version of the operating system. So, so just to summarize the advantages of FPGAs, um, high density allows us to create many complex logic functions. High performance, we can newer FPGAs allows us to run much faster. Um, our newest devices can run up to and over a gigahertz at this point. Um, but again, it's going to be lower than a fixed device through the discussion we had earlier. Uh, they are lower cost um, than uh, you might expect, especially the low end ones. You can get them real, uh, for uh, a much lower cost. Integration of many functions very customizable, very flexible for whatever the, uh, whatever design that you need, many different IO standards and features, fast programming, and we have a number of different types of devices in different ranges. Um, this is just a list of our current device families, the low end max devices going all the way up to our newest Agilex devices. And one, just one thing real quick with um, Max devices, these are a combination of CPLDs and FPGAs. They have an FPGA array, but they also include on-chip flash memory. So these do not need to have a separate device for programming. They get programmed automatically at power on. So instant on and very low cost. And finally, our SOC devices, we have FPGA devices that include um, uh, uh, a hard processor system. So dedicated uh, processors to give you basically the best of both worlds between hardware development and software development. So if you are a software developer, you can write uh, applications, you can run Linux on an FPGA uh, and also perform accelerated functions with an FPGA that uses an HPS. So. Now, all of this is tied together through Cordis, as people have been mentioning. Um, if you are more interested in Cordis, which uh, we don't have time in a class like or in a session like this to talk about, um, the Cordis Prime design software takes in your you take your design description um, and you put together IP that we provide, as well as your own custom code, and it allows you to easily build a programming image for the FPGA. Okay. Um, we've decided that next month we're going to have an introduction to Cordis Ask an Expert session, so you can come back for that. But we always have free e-learning and training available. Um, and in a moment, Steve is going to be putting the links to that in the chat as well as a survey um, about this session. You could probably do that at this point, Steve. Yes, thank you and, for the reminder. I'm doing yes, that now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, these are the resources that uh, Steve is putting in the chat. So if you want more information about FPGA specifically, um, you can go to the link. Uh, again, everything is from intel.com. If you are interested in uh, the Cordis Prime software, you can download it and get more documentation from the links shown. And I'm just repeating our e-learning and instructor-led training links. So this is our course catalog. So we have lots of trainings available. Um, I teach classes all the time. My colleagues, including Steve, teach classes, um, live instructor-led classes that you can check out all for free. And finally, development kits, good way to get started, having actual hardware um, for your FPG de uh, development process. So you can check those out. All right, so that ends our 
session. Are there any other questions in the chat or on the phone to, uh, yep. to finish up? Uh, a couple couple questions came in uh, right at the nick of time, I guess. Uh, could you share any resources about what comes after programming and testing FPGAs, uh, specifically about designing the boards that will hold the FPGAs? Oh, well, board design is <laughs> a whole other thing. Um, I used to be a board designer back in the day. Um, there are board design resources available um, at the Intel website. If you just search for FPGA board design, you'll be able to find documentation and, and other details. Um, and different IP that you use in your design might have detailed information about board design for their use, such as external memory interfaces. Anything else? Uh, nothing else. Uh, I, I would just like to add that the um, the recordings will go out. It takes a couple of days for us to process everything, get the recordings, get them set up on our server here. Uh, but we do send the recordings out to everybody that has signed, has that has registered and signed up. So if you registered, you should see a link to the recordings. Uh, feel free to share it with your colleagues uh, or anyone that you know that might be interested. Great. And you got the survey link in the chat. Got the survey link in the chat. Please fill that okay. out. Let us know what you think. Yep, so we greatly appreciate any feedback that you can provide. And uh, we've gone a minute over, but um, are there any other questions or anything left, Steve, that we, uh, nope. that we want uh, to cover? Not, Nothing else came in. All right, well, thank you everybody for attending. Like I said, next month, we're gonna do uh, an introduction to Cordis. So if uh, we piqued your interest here, um, please look for the invitation for next month's Ask an Expert session and we'll, uh, we'll do it again, focusing on Cordis. So thank you very much. And the recording will end shortly.